Our um, main speaker today for our main talk is uh, actually a native of Houston. Yeah, grew up in Houston and um, now lives in Washington, D.C. Does some really cool stuff up there, but the most cool thing she did in recent years is co-found the ex-Muslims of North America, which she tells me is almost becoming a full-time job, just managing the growth of this amazing organization. So we are um, really, really pleased and honored to welcome our very special guest speaker from Washington, D.C. But she came in to see family over Thanksgiving, so we didn't have to buy the plane ticket. That was nice. <laughs> um, but we were so glad she took time out of her Thanksgiving break to come and see us. Uh, let's give a warm Houston Oasis welcome to Sarah Hader. Um, so it's so wonderful to be here, and I'm so excited that something like this exists. And Mike tells me it's two years old, and I wish it was, it was around when I was leaving religion and I was sort of experiencing a loss of community. Um, so what I'm here to talk about today is what, how uh, Muslim community functions and how it, it becomes a way, it becomes something that hinders or sometimes altogether suppresses free thought. And this is kind of an aspect of the story that I think gets overlooked. Um, for many uh, that, that I know through my work with ex-Muslims and also knowing Muslims, um, questioning Muslims in my life, that this is why it's so difficult to move beyond strict interpretations of religion. Um, it definitely was the case for me. And um, I'm going to specifically talk about um, Muslim communities in the West, um, which are largely centered around a mosque. and sort of the different pressures that are faced um, from, with, with people from Muslim um, backgrounds. And these are different than those faced by people from Muslim majority countries, which as you guys probably know, uh, deal with state persecution, which is a completely different thing. But this here is more of a social um, hindrance and social block. Um, so you might know that, the, that family is often a, a big part of um, suppressing free thought in, in Muslim background families. Um, it's hard to overstate, though, the significance also of the community at large, and it's exactly this significance that makes them powerful tools for sub subverting unwanted behaviors. So why is this community so important in the first place to people from uh, Muslim backgrounds? And I think this, has, uh, this importance has a lot to do with the nature of the ethnic experience in America, especially um, the immigrant experience. Um, you hear a lot that America is land of you know, immigrants, I mean, the nation of immigrants. But um, in reality, I think if you're a brown person in America, if you're an immigrant and you maybe have a funny <laughs> accent, then it's hard to feel accepted and it's hard to truly feel as if you are an American. Um, I think foreign looking people, foreign sounding people are um, sometimes looked at with suspicion in, in certain parts of America especially. And um, this is very strong for people who look like they may be Muslim. And in, in, in we know that Sikhs and, and, and a lot of people who are perceived to be Muslim are targets of this kind of you know, abuse. And, and, and they are keenly aware of it. That's the thing, that you go, you go through life and you're always aware that people are perceiving you to be this way. Um, and Muslim uh, uh, religious obligations make it difficult to participate and partake in American <laughs> cultural customs, um, like happy hours and normal socializing, which are you know centered around drinking. Um, there's a lot of talk about you know sexual activity, which is of course forbidden in Muslim cultures. And this applies, of course, more to women than to men. And this is a lot based on my own personal experience as a woman uh, leaving Islam and finding my way through free thought. Um, American culture can be shocking to the outsider. Um, few programs are available to help them understand this new world and to both accept and gain acceptance in it, which is why this, something like this is so amazing, I think, uh, the, the fact that you guys are here to, f to give this sort of community. Um, and beyond just struggles of, based on the immigrant experience, um, Muslims face bigotry that is specific to Muslims, as I said. It's not uncommon, I think, to, to tune into a broadcast on the radio or on TV where people will uh, refer to Muslims as if they're animals or as if they are um, a, a very strong threat to American way of life. And this makes it difficult to, to become a free thinker if you are a Muslim. Um, I do want to clarify, there's a difference between inflammatory rhetoric that is based on hate versus reason, well-intentioned critique. 
you know, as someone who is a former Muslim and a current ex-Muslim, and someone who is still perceived to be Muslim, um, I know that hateful speech against Muslims exists. Um, but I don't think that this necessarily means that we uh, should stop reason critique um, when it comes to religion and religious practices. Um, so I think, I think what's important is that we, we create an atmosphere where people from Muslim backgrounds don't feel like they, that they feel like they are a legitimate and wanted part of American culture, which is not the way they feel right now. Um, this is even true for Muslims that have spent their whole lives here. I hear time and time again um, from American-born Muslims who actually uh, act American in a lot of ways, and they are susceptible to becoming free thought you know, uh, future maybe exes or, or humanists. But I hear this feeling from them that they don't feel that they are Americans, they're, they're accepted as Americans, they feel that they are merely tolerated. And there are sometimes even fears for, for out, all out persecution. Um, and there's a feeling that they will never achieve full acceptance by Americans as, as one of their own, so why even try? And this kind of pushes you back into the religious community. Um, and back into that. And once you are into that religious community, once they are there and providing you uh, with, this, um, with this social network, it fills a major void in the life of someone who is from a Muslim background. Um, it becomes, the mosque-centered community becomes a way to meet people. Um, primarily, it's, it's a social vehicle for a lot of people. And I know many people who don't have a social network out, at all outside of um, religion or, or family. So this is, allows you to be a part of community that, that wants you and will accept you with open arms. And there is, I mean, uh, with the ex acceptance of something like this, there is no um, liberal or secular alternative. And secular ethnic-based programs are often limited, if they exist at all. Um, and, but religious groups are very organized, and they're there. And I know people who, who are new to this country and don't have anywhere to go, and the mosque is there. They're there to give them a place to place to stay and they make them feel welcome um, and so it, may, it becomes difficult to step away from the religious aspect because if you step away from the religious aspect you will lose the community altogether um, so once you are part of this this community um, the social norms that are rooted in religion deeply rooted in religion make it difficult to immerse then into American lifestyle and sort of westernize um, for, for, exam for example, this is some, a lot of things that, that I personally went through, which is where friendships with non-Muslims was discouraged. And this, to me, the sort of, uh, you know, othered non-Muslims, they were, you know, them, you know, and not part of us. And it was hard for me to understand uh, people from non-Muslim backgrounds. Um, my only experience with people that were, say, Christian or atheist were, were you know, online and and not, not in real life, definitely. And it definitely made it difficult for me to see their point of view and to accept that maybe there's multiple truths out there in the world. Um, Western style clothing is frowned upon, which probably a lot of you know, especially in modest clothing. And actually, a lot of ex-Muslims, people who leave Islam, still have trouble with this. Uh, and even now, I don't wear modest clothing around my family, and I'm, I'm not allowed to. Um, it, despite being an adult, I'm not allowed to. But, um, <laughs> Contact with the with the opposite sex is obviously very discouraged, which makes it difficult to meet a potential mate. So who decides it for you? Well, your your religious family and your your and your mosque helps you find your mate. So you st stay in there. Um, moving out on your own is difficult, and for women, impossible. Um, you you grow up, you go to school, you st go to college in the area, and then you get married. Um, and, and I think a lot of people know that college is often a formative experience for people who, who, when they're leaving religious communities, it's the first time you're exposed to so many different viewpoints and you realize there's other things out there. And I know a lot of people left um, religious religions around that time and became more secular around that time. Um, so what this does, I think, it serves to isolate Muslims from the outside community. And I think another thing that is maybe specific to Muslims is that deviations from the norm are often dealt with by the family. And I think maybe a lot of you have heard of, you know, honor-based crimes, which is quite a heavy topic. I won't get into it. But there is a, there's a huge aspect of, of sh a fear of shame um, and ostracization from the community. And so deviations from the norm 
is, are something to be taken care of by the family specifically. So if, if your daughter is one who's stepping away from, from Islam, from religion, or becoming more of a free thinker, then it's, then it's the role of the father or the mother to keep her in place. Um, and this is so that the family will maintain status as morally upright members within the community, that they know how to take care of their own and keep them in line and, and such things. Um, so in the end, um, I think the problem is, is that what choice do questioning Muslims have? Um, they're, I think in between they're walking a hard place, not to use a cliche, but it's difficult to have um, a critical analysis of deeply held beliefs um, when you are isolated and excluded and there's multiple factors keeping you there. Um, they lack an understanding of literacy of the dominant culture due to the fact that they weren't able to intermingle. Um, and those that understand problems within the community, those that can be potential reformists, they feel paralyzed because if something happens, if they are ostracized from the community, um, there's such a steep learning curve in adapting to American culture. And they feel that they will always maintain an outsider status. Um, so I think that from both within the community and sort of from outside of the community, you're being fed an us versus them narrative. And this is coming from all angles. And I know when I was leaving religion, this was a huge part of, and this was a huge difficulty that I had to, that I had to get over, was that every time I felt that I did speak maybe a little bit critically about, about the religion, I felt that I was feeding into this narrative that would paint um, my family, my community, people I knew and I loved as a, a huge threat to the American way of life. Um, and that was a difficult thing to get over and that's still something that I struggle with. So I think that the more, the more excluded and isolated the community is, the less there is an acceptance of dissent or free thought or even a liberalization. And uh, today, it isn't easy to be an atheist or a free thinker or a secular person and still be part of, of, a, of a community like that. Uh, the Pakistani community, which is, which is where I'm from, um, is very deeply rooted in the religion. And it's quite difficult to, to leave the religion but still maintain those cultural ties. Um, so to the extent that, that there are solutions to this, um, I think it would be good if there was an American Islam. Um, if Muslims consider themselves part of American culture, of the American fabric, of the American story, and not as outsiders, not as an outside culture, or almost an antagonistic culture, which is the way I think they're, they, are, they, they feel, both due to inside pressures and outside pressures. Um, I think the, the American Islam should be one that is shaped to American ideals. Um, and this could happen naturally as Muslims become more immersed in American society, but like I said, this is difficult to do for, for a variety of reasons. Um, but I have heard some positive things. I've heard there, there are progressive mosque systems that practice democratic leadership versus sort of authoritative religious leaders. Um, and, and that's very encouraging to me. That to me shows that they're sort of becoming more American and more accepting of different viewpoints. Um, pluralism needs to be respected within the community. Uh, the idea that there are many different ways of practice that can be valid, and of course, a big part of that is less isolation. Meeting Christians, meeting Buddhists, meeting Hindus, becoming friends, um, feeling connected to these people, and realizing that they have maybe truths and and good things to offer as well. Um, but those are aspects that I think Muslims kind of need to work on. Um, but what can the average you know, American do? What can the free thinker do? Um, I think the best thing to do is to attempt to make this country one where, where Muslims don't feel like an antagonistic force. And I'm not saying this means let them off the hook. You know, don't, don't criticize, don't criticize their, their, you know, some of the practices that are harmful. But that is a difference between you know, reason critique, compassionate critique, and one that, that makes them out to be sort of a demonic presence, you know, and something that's going to take over America and ruin the American way of life. Um, and I think there is a big difference, and I think that I think we can intuitively tell when there is, when there is somebody who's making that compassionate, uh, reasoned critique as a way to move the community forward, and someone that's, that's uh, kind of a bigot, you know, and spreading bigotry. Um, another thing that can be done is to help secular people from Muslim backgrounds organize, uh, help, help them organize and elevate their voices and to realize that there are Muslims who like the status quo within their community and they do not want change. Um, but there are also reformers. They're there. They're, they're not heard of. They're very quiet. Um, Irshad Manji is very good. Um, uh, uh, 
the two, I think, should not be given weight, equal weight, but that would be my personal opinion. 